So uh, today I want to sort of finish up talking about air pollution. We're going to continue talking about uh, studies that look at the effects of air pollution on infant and child outcomes, uh, and then also talk a little bit about sort of the relationship between air pollution and adult outcomes, although the evidence there is not as strong. Uh, somewhere kind of in the middle of this, probably, I'm just going to have like a, um, I want to you guys to bring into groups, and we'll have sort of a BSL-related discussion that's, or a discussion that should, in theory, touch upon the BSL, that's just related to current events. Um, so that'll just be kind of like five or ten minute within group discussion, and then uh, one or more groups can sort of give their opinions. Um, so, oh, and then the other thing, of course, uh, importantly, is that the midterm, I guess, is a week from today. So uh, just sort of some logistical things. So definitely Friday we'll have a midterm review session. Uh, today or tomorrow I'll post some, like, practice uh, midterm problems, basically, you know, old uh, versions of the midterm. Um, the solutions to the first two problem sets are online. The second problem set is graded, uh, and the grader should be dropping it off my office sometime today, so I'll definitely bring that by on Wednesday for you guys. Uh, and then the, uh, we'll also, like, post the uh, solutions to the third problem set immediately uh, after you turn it in on Wednesday, so you'll have those as well. Uh, because of that, you know, uh, there definitely won't be any late problem sets for PS3. Uh, you know, we get in before we post the solutions. Um, and then uh, I guess that's about it. In, I've sort of already announced this, but just to, to re, uh, make sure everybody's clear. The, the material is only going to go through like Section 2 on this level, so including Section 2 basically through the BSL stuff. So anything beyond that, including what we're covering today and also what we covered um, you know, on Friday, uh, that's not going to be on the midterm. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yep. Uh, there's going to be a mixture. So there will be like a couple true false probably, and then there'll be like a problem where you have to sort of go through and solve something. Um, so I mean, it should be apparently most people midterms, but basically it's going to be a mixture of what you've done on the problem set so far. Uh, yeah, you can use a calculator, uh, but no like notes or other outside materials. I mean, in general, hopefully the, the, um, you know, the problem where you have to solve something, I'll try not to make the values come out to be weird decimals or anything like that. So in theory, you should be able to do it without a calculator. Excuse me? Uh, so they're in the, I just uh, put them up this morning, uh, and they're uh, in the problem sets directory on P courses in a folder set solutions. Okay. Uh, okay, so continuing the discussion about air pollution, uh, there's a couple of papers that are sort of, uh, that, that look at uh, infant and children's outcomes. So there's a paper by uh, Chris Kniddle and Doug Miller uh, and Nick Sanders that uses variation in air pollution that's generated by weather and traffic. Uh, so the idea here is essentially that uh, they're using data that are similar to the Korean Nadel data. So basically, Korean Nadel, you know, said that they were using changes in pollution, the sort of like weekly or monthly fluctuations in pollution across different zip codes. Uh, the actual data they use for the, um, the, the health outcomes were basically the birth uh, census from uh, California. So they, they actually have data on every single birth that occurred in California over uh, a specified period. And uh, they can sort of place those births, you know, geocode them, figure out where they are, place them in various zip codes, and then link pollution to, uh, to births. Likewise, here they have um, basically the same data. So one thing that's kind of interesting about this paper is that they replicate the previous paper and find that maybe the findings are not quite as robust as one might have believed. So they're somewhat, so the results are somewhat sensitive to how they actually specify the regression, like which variables they choose to use or exactly which data points they are including in there. Um, the, but the, the main goal of this paper is to actually use sort of a different strategy for trying to estimate the effect of um, air pollution on uh, on uh, health outcomes, which is to use sort of variation in pollution that's generated not just by um, so not just by weather. So as we've discussed earlier, weather does have an important impact on pollution. The problem with just using variation in uh, in pollution that's generated by weather is that weather could have its own independent impact on health outcomes, right? So if I tell you that sort of under certain weather conditions, so say like when it's hot and when there's no um, there's no winds to sort of clear the air, that pollution levels are higher, uh, and that deaths are also higher during those same conditions, uh, you know, you could either interpret that as evidence of an effect of pollution on deaths, or you could potentially just interpret it as evidence that uh, heat has some negative impact on, on health. And so what you're picking up is actually the effect of the weather rather than the effect of the pollution. So what they do is actually use pollution intercourse generated by this combination of weather and traffic. So the idea is essentially that like, if there's more traffic, there should be more pollution, in theory, uh, because you know, cars generate pollution, obviously. Uh, and furthermore, if there's more traffic on, like, a hot day when there isn't much wind, that's going to be worse for pollution than if there's more traffic on a cold day when, uh, say, there is wind. Um, so the argument in their paper is that variation in air pollution should be uncorrelated, that this variation in air pollution, the variation in air pollution that's being generated by this interaction between weather and traffic, should be uncorrelated with other factors that affect infant health, uh, particularly after they control for weather and they have So, you know, they couldn't just use the variation in weather, the pollution, the pollution variation is generated by changes in weather, if they're also controlling for weather, because after you control for weather, you're not going to actually have any variation left in weather. Um, that's why they have to interact, basically, the weather conditions with the traffic conditions. Uh, and so after they do that, and then control for weather and day of week, they find that even after controlling for all of these things, that PM10 correlates with infant deaths. So, uh, so this is we suggest some evidence that uh, the fine particulate matter, so this is, this is particular matter less than 10 microns, uh, so there's, there's, we suggest evidence that fine particulate matter uh, does have a negative impact on, on infant health. Uh, they don't, however, find any relationship between either carbon monoxide uh, or ozone and infant deaths, uh, but the confidence intervals are, are pretty wide on, um, on, on those effects. So basically, like, the way you would do this is not that, not that they're uh, estimating that there is no effect of these pollutants on infant deaths, but basically just they don't have enough precision to really make a conclusion one way or another about whether or not those pollutants have any effect on infant deaths. Um, so another recent paper uh, by Janet Curry and uh, Reed Walker, who's at the time was a graduate student in Columbia, but now is uh, here at, at Berkeley as well. Uh, you kind of know that a bunch of people on these papers are at Berkeley. Uh, is, I think this is like, I like this paper because I think the, the research design is like pretty easy to understand, hopefully, uh, and, and somewhat compelling at least. Uh, so what they are doing is they're again trying to sort of estimate whether or not uh, local pollution has an effect on um, infant uh, health outcomes. And so they use the introduction of electronic tolling uh, on certain East Coast highways as uh, basically a natural experiment that they argue changes uh, pollution levels in the areas near the electronic tolling. So you know, this, is, this is basically um, similar to like fast track if you're crossing the Bay Bridge uh, or any of the other bridges where instead of stopping at the toll booth, you just drive through with your electronic transponder in a car. Uh, the difference is that, uh, you know, out, so like in California, with the exception of some like toll roads in Southern California, uh, basically we don't really have any toll highways. We only have like toll bridges. Uh, but they're looking at uh, toll highways on the East Coast. So there are many, many more of these, um, what they call Easy Pass uh, toll booths on the East Coast than there are like fast track locations on the West Coast, just because fast track is you know, just limited to uh, the bridge approaches. Uh, so they rolled out this technology in the late 1990s. Uh, and in theory, the argument
And so this is going to reduce congestion near the near the uh, toll plazas and just sort of reduce the total number of cars that are basically idling in that area. One problem with the paper is they don't have a lot of evidence uh, demonstrate or like available to actually measure the effect of the electronic toll booths on pollution. So ideally, like what you would like to have uh, is a case where they had pollution monitors next to all the toll booths, and then they could look sort of before and after and show you that yes, you know, pollution levels of particular pollutants that, uh, that we think are, are linked to automobiles did in fact drop by however many percent after the electronic tolling came out. They don't actually have that. So like what they will show you is that uh, basically infant deaths or I think maybe low birth weight uh, infants, the incidence of low birth weight infants, uh, was reduced in these areas near toll plazas relative to other areas that are near highways but aren't near toll plazas uh, after the easy pass technology rolls out. But they can't really sort of tell you exactly what the percentage change in air pollution uh, was that they think caused that, that reduction in deaths. So this is essentially like a difference in differences design. Uh, what's happening now is that you can think of basically um, areas that are near the highway and near those easy pass path toll booths as being treated areas. And then areas that are further from the easy path toll booths but maybe still near the highway are going to be the control areas. So like the way that you want to think about this spatially is there's sort of three types of areas that you can imagine. So if this is you know, the highway. Uh, if you have a toll plaza here, um, then the treated area is going to be you know, this range of people who are near the toll plaza and near the highway, and so after easy pass rolls out, should in theory be uh, exposed to reduced pollution levels relative to what they were exposed to before. Um, the control areas are going to be sort of out here, so so these are going to be areas that are also close to the highway, uh, but don't have toll plazas next to them. Uh, and so if you think about sort of the raw levels of pollution, it's not the case that the uh, pollution level in the treated area should go below the pollution level in the control area, right? If you think about sort of what's happening over time, what should be the case is essentially the pollution level here was elevated relative to the control area because you had all of this congestion near the toll booth, then you remove a lot of that congestion, and so the pollution level drops in this treated area uh, down to maybe the level of the control. It might still actually be a little bit higher because it's not like you have no congestion after easy pass schools. But the point is that there's sort of like a, a negative shock or a shock that reduces air pollution relative to what it was prior in this treated area, uh, and in the control area there's either no shock or there's just some sort of like aggregate level shock that you know maybe pollution is just trending down over time as emissions controls come in and so forth get better. Uh, but then that would be happening equally hopefully in both the treated and control areas. Uh, now there's a third area, sort of a third type of area you could imagine, which would be like the areas that are uh, very far from the highway. So in theory, you could in theory, you could use those areas that are very far from the highway as sort of like another control group or add them into the control group. Uh, the benefit of doing that would be that you increase your sample size, at least in the control group. So there's, there could be some sort of modest gains in terms of um, the precision of your estimates, just because you're getting a bigger sample. Uh, but the cost of doing the reason why they don't do that is that you know, we want the control areas to always be kind of like as representative uh, of the treated areas as possible, but of course not subject to treatment. Uh, and as you get further and further away from the highway, you tend to think that these areas are going to be less and less representative of uh, the treated areas, right? So in the extreme case, you could be comparing like um, an urban area that's near the highway and has a full plaza to a very rural area that's far away from any major highway. That's not going to be like a great comparison because probably um, you know whatever, tra- whatever trends are uh, operating in the, the rural area are probably not necessarily the same trends uh, that are operating in the urban area. And ideally, we want the control area and treated area to have uh, parallel trends or to evolve similarly uh, in terms of the outcome uh, absent the, any intervention. So um, so you don't end up using using these sort of outer lying areas uh, as as control as part of the control group. You basically just throw them out of the sample. So the results of the paper were uh, essentially that the incidence of low birth weight uh, decreased by about 10% in the highway areas near the easy pass uh, toll plazas relative to highway areas that are far from the easy pass uh, toll plazas. Uh, so that's that's 10% off the, the base level. That's not 10 percentage points, uh, which would probably be possible because the, the low birth weight incidence, I think, is probably low, lower than 10% to, be, to begin with. Um, nevertheless, you know, this is a pretty large effect if you think about it for a little while because the question is kind of like, you have to think about, well, you know, how many, there's, you know, there's some baseline uh, rate of, uh, of, of low birth weight um, births, and you have to think about how many of those could plausibly be caused by air pollution at all, right? I mean, even if you have, like, perfectly pure air with absolutely no pollutants in it, there's always going to be some low birth weight babies because there's a lot of factors that can lead to, to low birth weight. Uh, and so you have to think about, like, well, you know, how many could even be due to air pollution to begin with? Um, I don't know. I'm sure it's less than 50%, though. Uh, you know, maybe it's, like, 40%, maybe it's 20%, maybe it would only be 10%. If you just decide it was only 10%, then this estimate would look really large because that would mean that the maximum reduction you could ever get would, from cleaning up the air would be 10%. And we're not cleaning up the air entirely here. Like, we're reducing air pollution, uh, but we're not reducing it all the way down to zero. Uh, so, you know, I think. I think your prior has to be that uh, you know, if you believe this 10% number, then your prior has to be that something like at least probably like 30 or 40% of all low birth weight babies are caused by air pollution, just because you're not talking about a 100% reduction in air pollution here. You're probably again they don't have like a lot of data, so it's hard to say exactly how much reduction it is, but it's probably on the order of maybe like 20 to 40% or something. So they're not gonna um, you're not gonna find that uh, that air pollution falls to zero uh, after they they roll out the easy pass technology. Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Uh, so I think it's something like I think this one is like maybe a couple kilometers, like a radius around the toll plaza, and then the controls they're talking about maybe five to ten kilometers. I forget exactly. I have to go back and look at the data, but we're talking in like sort of you know, single digit kilometer numbers. Um, and that's a very good question because the so you do want the control area to be far enough away that it's not actually subject to treatment, right? Because if you make the control too close, then uh, you're actually going to underestimate the effect because the control is going to be partially treated, uh, not like a pure control. Um, okay, so so that's kind of a summary of uh, the uh, the evidence on um, infant and you know, child outcomes. Uh, the relationship between infant child outcomes and air pollution. Uh, so I want to talk about um, the evidence on uh, the effects of air pollution on adult health, which is not um, really is not as robust. Uh, but I guess before then, let's, uh, let's have the VSL discussion. So if you're not in your groups, or you're not like seated close to your groups, you guys should move around. Uh, but so the, the, basically the topic that I want you guys to think about for a little while uh, and come to a conclusion one way or the other, I'm not saying there's a right answer on this, I just want to see what your reasoning is, is uh, related to you know, this, um, this Ebola case in, uh, in Dallas. So I'm sure probably most of you are aware of what's been going on just because it's sort of on the front page of the news. Uh, but in case you're not uh, quite aware or, or weren't following all the details, you know, there was a, so there's somebody who was infected in Liberia who came to Dallas uh, prior. I mean, he obviously was infected before that didn't show any symptoms until after he arrived because there's like a uh, maximum 21-day incubation period. I think the process is like one to two weeks on average. Uh, so you could be infected, or sorry, infected, not uh, able to transmit the disease, but not showing any symptoms. Uh, so even when you
there was like not great uh, information sharing. And so they didn't realize at some point when they're trying to make a diagnosis, they didn't realize that he had just come from an area where he was likely to have been infected. Uh, so they sent him home and then uh, obviously didn't get better and came back a couple days later. And that time they figured out that he actually had Ebola um, and admitted him. Uh, and then, so at that point, so the, the, before that point, then, you know, they say, well, it's not that, it's not that trans, uh, easy to transmit. Like, it's not like, um, I don't know, I mean, it's not like a flu where uh, the flu, I guess, can't technically be airborne, or uh, I mean, I think it actually has to be in, like, some sort of bodily fluid while it's airborne, uh, but it's certainly much easier to, uh, to cast the flu than, than uh, Ebola, where you have to come to direct contact with bodily fluids. Um, so prior to the point at which they diagnosed him, it would be, uh, like, the chance of somebody who came in casual contact with him uh, developing the disease is not super high, but certainly, especially when he's, like, vomiting and stuff like that, uh, it's, you know, it's non-trivial. Uh, in theory, after they diagnosed him, it should have been uh, very unlikely for him to spread it to anybody, because at that point, you understand what you're dealing with, and so you take the proper precautions. Uh, so they were monitoring all the people who he'd come in contact with before, uh, and so far, I believe none of them has, has uh, developed any symptoms. But then a nurse who treated him developed symptoms, or developed symptoms, and, and went and got tested, and in fact, uh, you know, had, uh, had been infected by him uh, after uh, the, the point at which they already knew he had Ebola. So in theory, she had been, like, taking proper precautions, but obviously, either the were not sufficient, or, uh, or gee, there was some sort of lapse in, in um, following the protocols. Um, so uh, I think, I mean, so from a, so the, the question that, that I want you guys to think about is essentially, you know, so from the nurse's perspective, uh, you're on a job where, so we talked about, like, estimating the VSL using, uh, using variations in, like, riskiness of jobs and looking at the wages that people have to accept in order to, uh, to take a riskier job. So she already, I mean, she knew that, you know, like, she knew what she was dealing with uh, when she had to go in and treat this patient. Uh, and it is, uh, you know, um, employment in the United States is, uh, is at will. So both the employee and the employer can quit uh, at any time. The employee, the employer can always fire the worker, uh, and the employee is always free to quit. Um, so certainly she could have chosen not to, uh, not to get into that situation. Uh, like, and like, so at a minimum, certainly she could have quit. Uh, that would be the most extreme reaction. Uh, we don't know sort of in the, like, whether there's something that would be less harassing. You know, she just said, like, forget it, I'm not going to do it. Who knows what the employer would have done. They could have said, like, okay, then you're fired. Or maybe they could have said nothing. Or maybe they could have, like, you know, not given her a raise next time or something like that. would be something somewhere in the continuum of doing nothing and firing her. Uh, um, so, uh, so we know that, however, like, you know, she didn't, like, refuse to, to have contact with him. Uh, and, and, of course, you know, presumably she was taking precautions, so we don't know exactly what uh, risks she was necessarily thinking uh, were going on in her head. In retrospect, I'm sure you're kind of like, wow, why did I do that? Uh, because hindsight is 2020. Um, but but the, the question I want you guys to think about uh, uh, from, you know, ex-ante standpoint is essentially whether or not her behavior and the behavior in general of, you know, like, hospital staff who, who have to, to treat them, like, whether it's sort of consistent with VSL estimates uh, that we've been talking about in the, uh, in the course. So, essentially, like, does it seem like these people were sort of too uh, risk-loving, essentially? I mean, we don't, that's, the word we, that's what we call, like, not risk-averse, which is maybe kind of a weird thing, but basically, does it seem like these people were not risk-averse enough? Uh, or, or do their actions, like the actions of you know, hospital staff, are willing to go and treat the, the patient? Um, or do they seem somewhat consistent with uh, the VSL values we talked about in the life? Which, or, sorry, VSL values we talked about in the course, which are generally in the order of you know, a few million dollars. Uh, so again, I'm not looking for. I'm not saying there's like a like definitely yes or definitely no answer here. Uh, I just want to see sort of what you think. And like, you know, I think either either side is defensible, but but I want to hear the reasoning uh, within your group of why you would uh, either conclude yes or or either conclude no. Um, so I'll give you about like maybe five to seven minutes or something. To talk about it, and then I'll just need a volunteer. I'll pick something.